It's my pleasure to welcome you all to what I believe is our fourth in our series of joint DOL and, H and CGD seminars. Uh, the first that we're hosting here in EOL, and it's our great pleasure to see new faces here. Uh, before we get started, I need to say that there are going to be two EOL seminars, uh, one tomorrow, one next day, uh, at, in the small seminar room at 2 o'clock. Uh, and you can go to the website and find our titles, and they've been emailed out. So today, it's my pleasure to welcome Brian Medeiros. Uh, Brian got his BA in physics from Berkeley, and then went a master's, and then later a PhD in atmospheric sciences from UCLA. Um, he followed that. He, while he was at UCLA, he got a Brian Bosart Memorial Award for outstanding service contribution from a graduate student. And uh, then he went, uh, was a postdoc, and spent most of the time, I guess, visiting at CSU, yeah. working at CM. And map, and uh, oh, and I forgot to mention that your PhD was with Bjorn Stevens, who many of you know here, been a frequent visitor and user of EOL facilities. Um, so it, in 2009, you started here as a project scientist, and have been doing lots of lots of work there, including uh, being on uh, Clivar working group. And most important is that next year you're going to be the CGD seminar. Yeah, here. yeah. So if you want to give a CGD talk, let me know. <laughs> so I'll let you introduce your talk. Thanks, Great. Brian. Thanks, Steve. So since this is a joint, let me move this down a little bit. So since this is a joint CGD EOL seminar, I decided to try to focus on the connection between climate models and observations. And you'll see, it'll be obvious that my bias is toward the models. I'll show some observations and poke at them a little bit, but I, it's not an observation intensive talk. Um, but that's maybe on purpose, so we can think about while, while you drift off um, and daydream about things that I'm not talking about, you can, you can try to be thinking about how observationalists and climate modelers can come together in more productive ways. And so I'm just trying to provoke those thoughts um, and not put you to sleep. So this is the outline of the talk. We're gonna talk, we're gonna, we're gonna cover the tropical Pacific um, starting uh, in, in, three, in three acts, so from the South Pacific uh, northward. So the first act will be um, models um, tend to underestimate the the cloud fraction in these stratocumulus regions off the coast of Peru and Chile. And that's true of basically every model you can imagine. So if you go look at the CMIP-5 models and just plot cloud fraction um, or errors in cloud fraction in, the, in their climatologies, every model underestimates the amount of cloud fraction uh, in the stratocumulus decks. And people think that stratocumulus decks are very important because they reflect a lot of light. So we'll, we'll start We'll start with taking a look at whether or not CAM can represent stratocumulus realistically or not. Then we'll just follow a stream, a streamline into the tropical eastern Pacific, um, skipping the trade wind cumulus regime, unfortunately. Um, you can, we can talk about that later. But then we will look at the high resolution version of CAM 5 and look at why it rains too much in the eastern tropical Pacific ITCZ. And then finally, we'll move even farther to the west and look at the diurnal cycle over the tropical Pacific, far out into the ocean, away from continents, where they, where continents mess up everything. Uh, and we'll look at um, basically the diurnal cycle of low-level winds and convection and try to understand what controls that variation. And besides being related to tropical clouds and convection, these three pieces of the talk will have another thing in common, which is that we'll use the same tool to investigate them, which is what we call CAPT. Is the, oops, too far. It's the Cloud Associated Parameterization Test Bed. It used to have a different name. It became obsolete, so they changed it, and now it's the, and now it's this. And this is basically our weather forecast mode in CAM, the, which is our community atmosphere model. And it's it's not anything real fancy. Basically, we take uh, some kind of estimate of the atmospheric state, usually from an operational analysis from ECMWF or from some other um, center. 
and we take the state variables, u, um, u and v, t, q, and surface pressure, and we just put them into a model restart file or initial conditions file, and then we run the model. And we, the way that we do it, our flavor of CAPT, is that we run a spin-up cycle. So we run, this, we run that, that simulation for six hours, we stop, we write out an initial conditions file, then we go back to the analysis and put in the state variables again, do it again for six more hours. And we do this every six hours for a long time. At some point, the slow components of the model, like the land surface or the aerosol burden, become more or less accustomed to the, the climate that the analysis wants rather than the climate that CAM wants. And so at that point, we, can, we say, OK, we'll run for six hours and write a restart file, but also just keep going. And those are our hindcasts. And we usually generate a, a series of hindcasts, average over them, and look at the statistics of the model errors in some way or another. Um, what we usually don't do is look at the global forecast in the way that people who look at forecasts do. Um, so this is an example. And um, so this is a forecast of surface pressure from October of 2008 just randomly picked from one of my ensembles of forecasts. And the, it shows the 12 hour, 24 hour, 48 hour, 8 hour, and 96 hour lead time forecast for surface pressure. I mean, as simple as you can get. Um, and you can probably tell that I don't often look at these things, because if I did look at them often, I would have found some really interesting weather event to show you. But here we see this kind of just boring tropical um, weather. Nothing, nothing too exciting to point out. Um, a lot of people will then just look at the bias associated with this, if it comes up. Um, by, by taking the analysis and just taking the difference and looking at the growth of the bias. So we see there's, the biases are pretty small for the first couple of days, and then they start to become pronounced. By, the, by day four and day five, we're really getting actually toward a state that the that's basically like the atmosphere's preferred climatology. We quickly go away from the analysis and toward the model climate. And I'll show you a better example of that in a few minutes. And again, if we were interested in CAM as a weather model, we would probably make up some statistic to, to assess the skill of the model. And so here I just showed as an example the mean square error of the global surface, pre surface pressure as a function of lead time. I made that yesterday. It's the first time I've ever looked at a skill score for CAM. I mean, this is just not the way that we use these capped simulations. So the way we usually use them is to generate that ensemble of forecasts and then go and look at a specific phenomenon or a specific bias and try to understand it. And this is a, this is a completely different problem, I think, and one that we're not we're not expecting CAM to solve. Brian? Yes. Are you looking at only? In general, we're looking at a yeah. In general, we use CAP to look at a sequence of five-day forecasts. In this in this example, I was actually taking the error and averaging the error, well, or adding up the error. The difference between the difference between the analysis and the forecast. So I think of CAP as being fitting into a hierarchy of configurations of our climate model um, that vary in complexity from over on the, on the edge of the screen, the fully coupled system, which is the Earth CESM, the Earth system model, that has, that's, pretty, that's the most unconstrained configuration you can imagine of the, of the model. And then more constrained is the atmosphere-only version of the model where you prescribe SST and greenhouse gases and things and let the model go and generate its own climate um, constrained only by the, by the boundary conditions. And then there's capped which is a little bit more constrained in the sense that it's still the free-running atmospheric model forced by the observed SST and greenhouse gases and things, but is also initialized from a very from a realistic state and only run for a few days. So it's, con it's a slightly more constrained in that sense. And you can think of data assimilation as being s constrained in a similar way, 
where you would ingest all of the observations into your modeling system, generate it, and generate your own initial guess at, the, at, that, at that initial condition, and then let the model run from there and generate a forecast. So there's a difference between capped and data assimilation then, because we're using a foreign analysis as our initial condition, and data assimilation would use the native physics uh, of the model. And they give different and complementary information. And it's not necessarily a bad thing that CAPT uses a foreign analysis, because in that sense, the, the, model's, the model's error is not already built into the initial state. And we can see the, the drift away from the, that initial state very quickly. And in, in a data assimilation system, you already have some of the model error built into your initial guess. And you might not see the error growth as well. And then there are really strongly constrained um, idealized versions of the model, like the single column model, where you just take a single column and run the physics, tightly constrained by whatever you put as the boundary conditions. Nudged runs, where you're always relaxing some aspect of the simulation back to some either idealized or observed state. Or specified dynamics, where the physics are active, but the dynamics are set. So we can have all these things, and they're complementary. Um, but today, we're just going to focus on capped. And so this is an example of a series of hindcasts from CAPT looking at just one grid point in the southeast Pacific uh, at 85 west, 20 south. And I picked this point because there's a buoy there, and you'll see the, that in a second. And so this is just surface pressure again, just for an illustration. And you can see I offset the surface pressure time series a little bit each time, so you can see the individual wiggles of the forecasts. And you can see there's some variation among the forecasts, and they wiggle around. And there's a semi-diurnal cycle. And note that, because we'll come back to that at the end. And for comparison, I put the climate mode on the bottom. And that's an AMIP run. So that's the atmosphere-only model running by itself. And the, the only difference between these CAM4 hindcasts and this CAM4 AMIP run is that the AMIP run was initialized a long time before October of 2006. So it's already forgotten its initial condition and it's just running constrained by the observed SST. So then we can start to talk about what the capped forecasts actually help us to understand. And in this case, we're looking at the Southeast Pacific, so that's the coast of South America, Peru and Chile over there. And the, that buoy is somewhere down here, sitting there in the ocean for a long time, observing clouds and, and SST and ocean conditions. And there's a cruise that goes and, and services that buoy annually. And we'll see data from that cruise in a few minutes. Um, and I, I won't talk too much about the climate of this area, except to say that these are boundary layer clouds. They're low level clouds that, are, uh, that sit under a strong inversion. The, uh, there's a, w the trade winds are blowing up along the coast. There's a cold advection in the lower levels. And we kind of understand the physics of static cumulus in some sense. But climate models, as I mentioned earlier, do a really bad job of representing them for a number of reasons. And so the question we'll ask for the next few minutes is, how well does CAM simulate static cumulus using a series of forecasts of October of 2006 um, focused on this region in the Southeast Pacific? And we'll compare two versions of the model, CAM4, which is the older generation model, and CAM5, which is the newer generation. So we can start by looking at just the cloud cover itself. So these are daily averages of cloud cover. Deep red means basically 100% covered by cloud. And blues are less than 50% cloud cover. And across the top of the, let me see if I can point. Maybe not. Oh, there it is. OK, so across the top, these are, these are daily averages from MODIS. So this is a satellite-derived product of cloud fraction. And you, along the coast of South America, you can see basically every day is pretty cloud covered. There's one day that it's a big clearing. But it then goes back to being cloud covered. And when you look at the climatology from MODIS over a long time, there's a very high fraction of cloud cover in October in this region. These are the individual forecasts um, turned into daily averages starting on the corresponding day, so the 22nd of October, and then running to the 26th. And you can see that the model starts with a cloud deck off the coast of Peru. Um, that's not quite realistic in terms of comparison with MODIS, but it's not, it's not too bad. 
And then over the course of the forecast, they, it, it evolves very quickly um, to something that's um, bigger. It's a region of, it's a larger region of cloudiness, but the peak cloudiness is generally a little bit less than it started with. Um, and it starts to take on this characteristic shape that's a little bit elongated um, and zonal compared to um, observations and compared to these, the first day of the forecast. And that's the evolution from the analysis state to the model climatology. And I'll, and I'll show you an, another example, another picture of that in a second. So these day, day five starts to look a lot like day five of every other forecast. And you might say, well, oh yeah, this is just, the model is just predicting the low level flow incorrectly. So the physics are responding to errors in the low level flow and making, and making the corresponding clouds. But this is an example um, of the low level flow. This is the ensemble mean over all those forecasts for October of 2006. Um, now showing CAM4 and CAM5 on the top and bottom. And this is day one of the forecast through day five of the forecast. And these pink vectors are the low level flow. And so day one, the low level flow has to be close to the analysis low level flow. So these winds are basically like the observed winds. And you can see that through the forecast in both models, there's not much difference either between models or between days of the forecast. So the winds aren't changing very much over the course of these five days or this, these, this series of five days. So, and so the, so the errors in the clouds that we, were, that we saw in the previous slide aren't coming from the resolved dynamics bombing and going off into a completely um, CAM-derived version of the, of the South, Southeast Pacific. It's really the fast physics, the parameterized physics that are driving the error in the clouds within this more or less realistic large-scale environment. So this is the comparison with climatology. Um, this is now miser cloud fraction in the color. Miser is just another satellite product. So white means nearly 100% cloud fraction. You can see there's a lot of white for October of 2006. This is the monthly average. Uh, this is the 10-year climatology. So you see there's a lot of light blue. So this is like a 90% cloud fraction um, over 10 years of Octobers. The lines are liquid water path from MODIS. You can see this region of very high liquid water path. And in the climatology, a region of very high liquid water path out here. So this is kind of the core of the stratocumulus deck. And then this is the CAM4 forecasts. This is the second day of the forecast, just averaged over the month. So it's like a monthly main, mean. And CAM5, the same thing. The second day of the forecast averaged over the whole month. And they, they've set up these stratocumulus decks that don't seem completely unreasonable, but they don't look very much like Miser or Modus. But they do look a lot like the 10-year climatology from CAM4 and CAM5, respectively. So you can see the CAM5 ends up with a stratocumulus deck that's really hugging the coast and breaks up pretty early on, or pretty near to the continent. CAM4 has this more elongated and zonal structure, um, and that looks a lot like its climatology, and a much less cloud to the south. So over, even over just a couple of days of simulation, the model is drifting away from the analysis state and developing its own cloud climatology. So in this study, what I wanted to do was really evaluate how, realistic, how realistically the stratocumulus are represented in each model. And to, so I could just take a box and try to and start averaging and look at it that way. But I was worried about choosing a box that was, you know, maybe not really representative of CAM4 stratocumulus or not representative of CAM5s, and so it wouldn't be a good comparison. Um, so what I did is I decided to come up with the criteria for what is a stratocumulus forecast. And to do that, I used lower troposphere stability, which is just a measure of the inversion strength. So remember, those, str those stratocumulus clouds form under very strong inversions. Lower tropospheric stability is a crude measure of that. It's the difference in potential temperature between 700 millibars and, and the surface. And so you can do things like composite by lower tropospheric stability. And you see that at very high stabilities, this is, so this is the vertical, vertical coordinate. This is nominal pressure versus mean lower tropospheric stability. And the colored field is the cloud liquid water. So at very high stabilities, above, say, values of 22 or so, 
we have very low level clouds in both models with more water than at lower susceptibilities. So this is working as a way to distinguish stratus clouds from more cumulus-like clouds at, at these le less, less stable conditions. So, and then the bottom panels here show the heat map of these, of uh, the 90th to 95th percentiles of this distribution of lower stratospheric stability. So this is basically the frequency of occurrence. It is the frequency of occurrence of the forecasts that are classified as stratocumulus. And the dark, thick black line is the 22 degree lower stratospheric stability uh, isotherm. So basically in CAM4, CAM5, and ERA interim reanalysis, that, um, that contour line is the bound, basically the bound of the region that's the core of the stratocumulus deck. And that cross that's in each of the panels is the, the buoy location, which is known to, we know observationally that's covered by stratocumulus almost all the time, certainly in October. And so we're sampling that point fairly well in all three data sets. So we're gonna take these samples now and take the ensemble of hindcasts for CAM4 and CAM5 and construct ensemble mean hindcasts and evaluate the structure of the stratocumulus. So this is a busy plot, but it it's, uh, packs a lot of stuff in. So this is CAM4 over here, CAM5 over here. And the top panels are basically looking at the surface energy balance terms. And there's uh, the models are, sh the model ensemble mean forecast is shown by the thick line. So this is latent heat flux from CAM4. Uh, and this is the net long wave from CAM4. And the, there's vertical lines that show the variation, which I should have just deleted for purposes today, but I didn't. And then there's horizontal lines, which you can't probably see, but I tried to mark with these thick ticks over here. And those are the observations based on the crews in 2006 that went out to service that buoy. And, and I, I just averaged all of those observations because they were, they were kind of sparse in time sampling, so I didn't think they resolved the diurnal cycle appropriately. So that's just the mean observational latent heat flux. CAM5, CAM4 does a good job of representing that latent heat flux. CAM5 overestimates the latent heat flux, perhaps indicating that the boundary layer is too dry in CAM5. The, uh, the net long wave in CAM4 is biased high. That means there's too much up, outgoing long wave from the surface compared to the observations from the ship. CAM5 does a better job. Both models overestimate the sensible heat flux. Um, I'm not sure that that's a real bias or not, or it might be a difference between how the observational um, observations are turned into this sensible heat flux. In any case, it's small and doesn't matter a whole lot for the surface energy balance. The real errors are more visible in the, when we start to look at the low cloud fraction and the liquid water path shown by black and blue respectively. So CAM4 is doing a good job of generating a, a mean low level cloud fraction around 70%, which is in good agreement with the ship-based observation of low cloud fraction of around 70%. Uh, with almost no diurnal variation. But then when we look at the liquid water path, we see this very large diurnal variation in CAM, in CAM4, that's in, it's incongruent with the variation in the cloud fraction. So there seems to be some inconsistency there, which we'll see again in a second. Um, but there, even with this large diurnal cycle in the liquid water path, the observed value is up here at around 110 uh, grams per meter squared. So there's a dry bias. And if we look, I don't know if you can see it very well, but there's a curved line, blue line on here that shows the trim diurnal cycle of liquid water path, so satellite derived liquid water path. And it's, the, it's, uh, it's higher than CAM4 in all cases, so there's this dry bias again, and the diurnal cycle is somewhat offset. And that might be a sampling issue with trim. I'm not completely convinced that the diurnal cycle is offset from the observed diurnal cycle, but it certainly is dry compared to trim. In CAM5, we see a better representation of, what, of a better consistency between cloud fraction and liquid water path, so they vary in concert. The nighttime cloud fraction reaches the observed values of around 70% or so, but the daytime cloud fraction dips, and the cloud, the cloud deck essentially starts to break up during the daytime and gets very dry, which, is, which um, ends up, when you average this thing, there's a strong dry bias and a low cloud bias in CAM5, in the CAM5 forecasts. And then the precipitation is um, similar. CAM4 is kind of drizzling too much all the time. 
except when it should be raining, when it's not quite raining enough compared to trim, which is shown in green. And CAM5 rains less. And it, interestingly, it, toward the end of the forecast, the, the rain, the drizzle that's associated with stratocumulus is actually being dominated by the convective component of rain. So that's driven by the shallow cumulus convection scheme. And it's still not getting as much rain as uh, trim would suggest is, is happening in that area during that month. So this is all to say that there are some biases. Some The models do good in some things, bad in some things, compared to the observations. And it's all associated with the structure of the boundary layer, which we can look at in more detail, looking at these profiles. So these are the daily averages in colors um, from the ensemble mean stratocumulus forecasts for CAM4 and CAM5. The black line, which you can see is usually close, is always close to the blue line, is the analysis value. So that's, that's the analysis that we start from. And then this dashed black line are radio sonned um, observations from that, from that cruise. So CAM4 has some serious boundary layer problems. It starts off probably too, too shallow and then becomes more shallow and moist. So there's a mo this moistening and this warming. And, the, and this is the relative humidity structure. You can see it's too moist, too moist at the lowest levels and too dry just above. This is associated with a cloud structure that starts out elevated and by days three, four, and five, the, the maximum cloud fraction is in the second model level or so, just sitting basically on the sea surface, which is not, um, not consistent with observations. CAM5, on the other hand, actually does a really great job of representing this well-mixed boundary layer structure. You can see the, the radiosons are captured. The structure that's observed by the radiosons is captured by CAM5 with this moist subcloud layer into the cloud layer and then into the inversion layer. Same thing with potential temperature and relative humidity structure. And this is associated with this cloud structure that's um, this well-defined cloud layer it has a clear subcloud layer, a well-defined cloud base, a fairly well-defined cloud top. So that, and the bias here is probably that in liquid water, there's just not quite enough liquid water in CAM5's clouds. And that's associated with that um, diurnal cycle error that we saw in the previous slide, and which is illustrated um, more dramatically here. So these are the ensemble mean forecasts for, the, for CAM4 and CAM5. Uh, this is the cloud liquid water, which we just saw in the daily means for, but now we see um, the diurnal cycle as well. And we see the boundary layer collapsing, the cloud deck falling down to near the surface. The, the lines here show the cloud fraction. So this is the 20% cloud fraction line. Notice that it's well above the liquid water um, contours. So these clouds have essentially no water associated with them, and we call those empty clouds. They do affect the radiation. Cam, um, so this is what I won't what I won't show are is the analysis of why this is happening, but I'll tell you why. It's because the the boundary layer scheme in Cam five is not getting a turbulent um, is not generating mixing from cloud top cooling. So that's not a term that goes into the boundary layer mixing, and so there and that's the main component of mixing in the stratocumulus uh, boundary layer. So that there's no way for CAM5 to support the well-mixed structure that we observe in stratocumulus. And so this, the boundary layer just collapses, the clouds go down, and it doesn't explain this inconsistency with cloud fraction. So that's a story for another day, I think. Uh, in CAM, when we switch to CAM5, the physics are very different from CAM4. Now we see this um, clear subcloud layer persisting through the simulations, and this really strong diurnal cycle. This is the nighttime cloud fraction maximum. It's a coincident with the cloud liquid water maximum, so there's this good correspondence between cloud fraction and cloud water. But during the daytime, in the afternoon, the, the cloud layer becomes decoupled from the subcloud layer. And that cuts off the moisture supply to the, cloud, to the clouds, and the cloud processes just basically dry out the layer, and so you lose your clouds over the course of the day. And this decou that decoupling between the subcloud layer and cloud layer is observed in the Southeast Pacific. Very, it's very common, but the, the physics in CAM5 seems to be aggressively removing cloud um, and killing, killing the cloud layer during the day. And of course, the, cl these, the reason that these clouds are climatically important is because they reflect a lot of shortwave radiation. And so the shortwave radiation is most abundant during this daytime, only 
only there during the daytime. So if you get rid of the clouds during the daytime, which is the only time those clouds are relevant, then that's going to project onto climate um, very strongly. So I want to wrap up this part of the talk really quickly by saying I think I snuck in a lot of observations to evaluate the stratocumulus in CAM4 and CAM5. We saw a number of satellite products, a, a number of ship-based products, and as well as uh, reanalysis and operational analysis. I don't think that this is the optimal way to evaluate, to use the observations to evaluate the, the clouds, but it's a, it's a step in the right direction, I think, to at least take forecasts and observations that, are, that are, should be coincident in time, that should be apples to apples comparisons, and make the comparison and the evaluation. And now I want to change topic a little bit by going upstream to the tropical East Pacific and looking at the ITCZ and the deep convection here, so far away from the stratocumulus we were just looking at, and look at the high resolution version of CAM, which is quarter degree, CAM 5. We're forgetting about CAM 4. It, its boundary layer is broken, so we're not going to look at it anymore. And we're going to look at um, high, the high resolution simulations of the ITCZ which were noted uh, as having a bias. They rain, it rains too much in the Eastern Pacific. And so this is work that Dave Williamson has been doing. And I'm just basically stealing from him to show you. Um, this bias in, in the high resolution CAM5 um, compared to trim. So you can see um, greens and yellows and even some reds in this monthly average of quarter degree CAM5 simulation uh, versus green, mostly greens and blues in trim. And notice that this scale is nonlinear, so that difference actually can be quite large. When we do a series of simulations, we can, we can capture the same behavior. So this is just a daily average from one forecast. This is day five of January 3rd, initialized from January 3rd of 2009. And we see these um, structures of intense precipitation in the ITCZ, which are associated with intense precipitation in trim but again, this scale is nonlinear, and now it's going much even higher. So where it's raining, it's raining too much in CAM 5. And so Dave has tried to figure out why that's true. And one way to, uh, to start looking at this is to divide the, divide the domain into the raining part and the non-raining part and look at the differences. And so when you take the non-raining part, shown over here, um, and look at precipitation and column water vapor. Where it's not raining in CAM, it's not raining. So that's good. Where it's not raining in CAM, it's not raining very much in trim. So that's good. Where it's not raining in CAM, the ECMWF um, column water vapor, so that's an, an analysis, and the CAM5 water vapor agree quite well. So where, where it's not raining, the precipital water is actually correct. And then when you look at the rain region, well, it's raining. Now this is trimmed, trim precipitation at around 6 millimeters per day. And CAM 5's precipitation, which is reaching around 11 or 12 millimeters per day. So we have a large error where it is raining. It's raining way too much, as we already saw from the maps. And when we compare with the ECMWF um, column water vapor, we see that there's way too much water in CAM. So where it is raining, there's too much water. So the question is, why is that water there? To understand that, um, we looked at the vertical integral of moisture divergence in the rain region and the non-rain region. So in the rain region, this negative value, um, around 7 millimeters per day, is a negative divergence, which is a convergence. So, there's rain, so the rain region is experiencing moisture convergence. The non-rain region has, these, has positive values, around 3 or so. That's a, so the non-rain regions are losing water vapor. So, um, to the rain region. And you can tell that it's going from the no rain region to the rain region by looking at the total, the entire region, and it's around zero, and the values are small. So it's not that the water vapor is being, is being taken away from the region completely. It is actually my, it's being, the resolved dynamics is transporting water from the no rain region into the rain region, explaining the, that bias in the precipitable water. So now the question is, what is the model doing about water, and why is it raining so much? And to look at that, um, Dave has looked at the 
the moist heating rate in, in CAM as a function, so that's pressure and this is heating rate as a function of daily average through the forecasts. And you can see this low level heating from the moist physics and the upper level heating that's somewhat smaller. And that's associated with this vertical velocity, omega, so negative values mean up. So where there's this, where there's, where the strong low level heating is happening, we have strong upward motion, that's convection being driven by latent heat release. And it's also associated with a low level convergence of moisture and, a, and then an elevated divergence of moisture. So this, this structure doesn't look quite like what you would expect in a deep convection regime. You might expect less low level heating and more upper level heating, a more top heavy looking profile. So to, to get closer to that expected structure, Dave took all of the heating, took the heating below 800 millibars and just reduced it artificially by 25%. And then took that excess energy and distributed it to the upper levels evenly and reran the forecasts doing, doing this procedure um, in line. So this blue line is day three from the upper panels, and the red line is the result of the experiment with reduced heating. So we do reduce the, the heating in the lowest <coughs> levels, but we also reduce the heating in the upper levels. So we've actually redistributed the energy from the lower levels into the upper levels. So we're seeing this is a feedback response in the forecast. The uh, heating is reducing the entire column. By reducing that low level heating, we're reducing the upward motion. So the convection is weaker. So you're not driving the strong dynamical feedback where you're pumping water in, it's being lifted, latent heat is being released, driving convection, which in encourages more low level convergence of moisture, driving more latent heat release, driving more convection. So we're cutting by, by moving this heating upward we're cutting out that dynamical feedback. And indeed, the, the moisture convergence into the low levels is smaller. So the conclusion here is that the resolved low level moisture convergence is forced by the release of latent heat in the lower troposphere. If you artificially elevate that heat source, um, or that heating, it breaks that dynamical feedback that I just described. And you, what I didn't show is that you get a better precipitation in column water vapor um, as a result. Um, but that's a very artificial experiment just to prove that the effect is there. And so Dave has done many, many experiments um, to futzing around with the physics to try to get a better result. And no satisfying solution has been found at this point. Um, so at this point, we think that the this set of model physics is a uh, not able to lift that heating in an appropriate way. And so as we go forward to developing the next version of CAM, looking at the high resolution or even the standard resolution, heating structure of the East Pacific um, ITCZ is probably, a, should be a high priority. So this is kind of a bummer. So I showed you stratocumulus uh, in CAM4 is terrible. The boundary layer scheme is broken. I showed you CAM5 is better in the stratocumulus regime, but the daytime has this strong loss of cloud, which is the only time that cloud is actually important to the climate. Um, and that's due to this decoupling issue, which I didn't, I didn't talk about trying to fix it, but it's hard to fix. I showed you that in the East Pacific, it rains too much. And we know why it rains too much, but we don't know how to fix it. And so I didn't want to end there. I wanted to give a, a little bit better, a little bit more hopeful <laughs> ending. So, I'm going to switch gears a little bit, go a little bit farther out into the ocean, farther, farther away from the continents, um, um, and look at, the, look at winds and convection and, and the diurnal variation. So you might say, well, there's a bias in the convection. We know already that it rains too much. But that doesn't mean that the diurnal cycle is wrong. So we can at least go and look and see. And so this part of the study was, this, this study has been really motivated by looking at these kinds of observations especially by Clara Desser and, other, and others, um, looking at the tau array of buoys in the Central Pacific and really taking a close look at the um, spatial structure of the diurnal variation of low level winds. So this is, and we'll, I'll show you this same figure again in a second, but this is the zonal wind in these top two panels broken into the diurnal harmonic and the semi-diurnal harmonic. And the, the lower panels are the meridional wind, the V wind, 
again broken into the diurnal harmonic of the daily of the diurnal cycle and the semi-diurnal harmonic. And there's interesting spatial structure here. Um, the zonal wind is the zonal wind diurnal cycle is dominated by the semi-diurnal harmonic, um, which so there's two maxima, and it's this is part this is associated with the atmospheric tide. So that's actually understood as an interesting forced mode of variability in the zonal wind. The meridional, the, so the, the diurnal harmonic is much smaller and shows much more varied um, spatial structure. Um, and we can come back to this later if we want. But the, I think that the interesting thing is the meridian, is the uh, diurnal harmonic of the meridional wind, which shows this rich spatial structure. So these guys show phase, and you can see, um, and the length shows magnitude. But you can see this phase propagation from the northern hemisphere into the southern hemisphere. And you can see that it changes as you go from the eastern side of the basin to the western side of the basin. So there's this really interesting structure of the diurnal cycle of, of meridional wind, which is not affected by the, or doesn't seem to be driven by the atmospheric tide, as like this uh, mode in the, in the zonal wind. This, the semi-diurnal um, component of the meridional wind is very small, and we can almost ignore it. Um, once we start looking at the low-level winds, we're, we're going to naturally get interested in the, in the ties to convection through low-level convergence. And so there's a lot of interesting studies, mostly looking at trim um, data uh, and reconstructing the diurnal cycle of precipitation uh, or, the, or precipital water uh, over the Central Pacific. And this is one example where the top panel is showing the diurnal harmonic, the amplitude of the diurnal harmonic of trims uh, precipitation. And you can see that it seems to be kind of small in the Central Pacific. And the lower panel is the, the phase of the diurnal harmonic. And it goes from 0 to 24 in local time. You can see that the, the whole tropical oceans are covered by this deep blue color. So there's a, that just means that there's an early morning um, or very late night, depending on your preference. Um, maximum precipitation is around 3 a.m. or to 6 a.m., depending on exactly which study you look at, which is different and opposite from the, the tropical land areas where you have a daytime and afternoon maximum precipitation. And I said that the amplitude is small, but actually, when you, when you compare this amplitude, which is a couple of millimeters per day, to the mean precipitation rate derived from trim, it's like 25%. So the, so the tropical rainfall is modulated by 25% or so in the diurnal cycle, which I think is enough to warrant some interest. Um, so we've started to take a look at, at these kinds of things in capped simulations using CAM5 again. This is the one degree version now, the, which is the standard uh, resolution. So we can look at the mean wind and precipitation in the Central Pacific, compare it to the tau rays shown here from this Uyama and Desser paper. We know that the wind is blowing in the right direction. That's good. Um, this shading in the upper figure is OLR, um, which is a proxy for precipitation. What I'm showing in the lower panels is the mean precipitation at four local times. So that's 0, 6, 12, and 18 local time from a series of hindcasts that span the seasonal cycle. So this is averaged over all seasons. And you can see that there's. Um, the, the mean wind vectors don't seem to change a whole lot. They do wiggle around, I'll show you in a second. But, um, but they, it's, it's a very small um, diurnal cycle in the wind on this scale. But you can see that there is a lot of variation in the precipitation. And it seems to maximize around 6 AM. And in fact, the panel I didn't show you is just 3 AM has the maximum precipitation in the ITCZ. And so, so the mean structure looks relatively reasonable. So now we will remove the mean and just look at the variation through the diurnal cycle shown here in these composites. This is again local time 0, 6, 12, and 18. Around 6 we see this red shading which is anomalous precipitation so it's raining a lot in the morning. In the afternoon the, there's this blue shading so it's raining a lot less than, than the average in the afternoon. So that's, that's consistent with the observations. And these vectors are the anomalous wind vectors if you choose a position, a point, and just go from panel to panel, you'll see them spinning around as they go from anomalously southerly to anomalously northerly. But I think the point um, is that where it's when it's raining a lot, there's anomalous 
convergence of the low level winds into the regions of rain, which makes sense. And, in the re and in, when it's not raining as much, there's anomalous divergence, which is consistent with what you'd think for regions of deep convection. We can do the comparison with those tau arrays a little bit more carefully by actually doing the analysis, breaking things down into the diurnal and semi-diurnal harmonics of the low-level wind components, and in even interpolating to the positions of the tau buoy arrays and doing a direct comparison of, of these figures. And we see that the zonal wind is dominated by its semi-diurnal harmonics, so we're getting some, some version of the atmospheric tide forcing the zonal wind, which is good. The, the diurnal component is actually um, con pretty consistent, but maybe a little bit larger than the observed diurnal component of the zonal wind. Um, in the meridional wind, these so again, these are phase vectors, so the direction is just showing you the time of the maximum wind, and you see this phase propagation in the observations, and you see a similar phase propagation in CAM5. The, the amplitudes, there's a hint that the amplitudes are capturing the right um, or the similar spatial structure as the observations. And this is encouraging. I didn't, I didn't expect to see such good agreement between the low-level wind diurnal cycle and the observations. And you might say, oh, but you've, you've put in a circulation that looks like the analysis. So the analysis, if the analysis gets the low-level circulation, then you're going to get the diurnal cycle. But in fact, that's that's uh, you can show even in an aqua planet you get very similar um, phase um, phases and amplitudes of the low level circulation. So it's not just that we're forcing it to be right; it's that it actually is right. So given that given that there's something going on that looks like more or less like the observations, we can now try to extend what we know from the observations by trying to understand the mechanisms that are controlling these variations in the diurnal cycle. And so one way I've been trying to do this is by looking at the interconnections, the interactions between the circulation and convection in clouds um, by trying to look at things like, um, like this shaded um, contour plot shows the anomalous horizontal divergence at three, this is three local time and 15 local time from 30 south to 30 north. And this is the vertical coordinate from the surface up to about 100, 100 millibars or so. And we see that when this, when there's this early morning precipitation maximum, we have anomalous divergence out of this outflow region at the top at the top of the deep convection. Um, and these lines show the the heating rate from the moist physics. So this anomalous divergence is associated with heating from the moist physics. Below this anomalous divergence is actually anomalous convergence. So this is just like we saw in the East Pacific, where we have an inflow into the region of deep convection. And then in the upper levels, there's an outflow. The physics is the, the moist physics is actually warming the whole boundary layer across the tropics during the nighttime, um, but only extending um, to the upper troposphere when we have deep convection. And then when you look at the mi precipitation minimum around 15 local time, we actually see the exact opposite uh, pattern. We see anomalous convergence in the outflow regions from deep convection. And now the physics has turned into a cooling term. So this is all preliminary stuff that's just trying to draw these connections between the, convec between the circulation and the convection. Um, and we've been trying to do things that are similar to what we looked at in the, East in the East Pacific problem, where we look at in the ITCZ and in the trade wind inflow region to the ITCZ, and look at things like the total tendency of temperature broken down into the transport term and the physics term. And the same thing for, for the specific humidity. This is the total specific humidity tendency, the transport tendency, and the physics tendency. And these are different local times from, from zero in blue to uh, 21 in orange. And um, I don't want to point out too many things here, except there is a diurnal cycle in these tendencies that's modulating the, the diurnal cycle of, in the IT, that's modulating the convection of the ITCC. There's this large transport term that's um, moistening the low levels in the ITCZ region. And that's just like in the Eastern Pacific example where we saw the no rain region and the rain region interacting. We see, if you go a little bit poleward into the trade wind region, we see this transport of moisture out of the trade wind regions, which is just being fed into the deep, deep convection region of the ITCZ. And you can, then we can play, think, we can look at things like breaking the physics tendencies down in by processes. 
And one of the leading hypotheses for what controls the diurnal cycle of convection over the tropical oceans is that there's this direct radiation convection interaction. So it, during the daytime, there, there's shortwave absorption by clouds, stabilizes the troposphere. And then during the nighttime, the sunshine goes away, so there's no shortwave absorption. And, look, and long wave cooling by, from the clouds destabilizes the troposphere, leading to this nighttime precipitation maximum. So we can look at the heating rates from the, radiative, the radiation scheme. So this is the shortwave plus long wave heating rates in the ITCC region and in the trade wind region, just for comparison. Again, showing different times through the day. And you see the daytime, it, during the daytime, we, see, we do have heat, heating due to the shortwave radiation. And during the nighttime, we do have cooling, that's good. And, in, and the cooling is stronger in the upper levels where you'd expect um, the long wave effects of clouds to be important and to strongly cool and destabilize and lead to convection. So to test this hypothesis that is the direct cloud radio effect that is driving the diurnal cycle of convection, we just turned it off and reran the simulations. That's shown here. So these dashed lines are results of a set of hindcasts that are just like the, the original set of hindcasts, except I've made the clouds completely invisible to radiation. And so we see that there, these dashes, these dashed lines are different from the solid lines. There's more short wave absorption during the daytime in the upper levels. There's less long wave cooling um, at nighttime at these at the slightly lower mid levels. And so you might expect, oh, well, obviously this cloud rate of effect is going to affect the diurnal cycle because we've completely changed the heating structure. But in fact, when we, and the, for comparison, there are no high level clouds in the trades. So you're basically comparing clear sky uh, heating rates to clear sky heating rates, and you see very little difference, which is good, sanity check. When we go and look at the diurnal cycle and we look at the change in the phase and amplitude of the low level meridional wind and the total precipitation, the things that we were interested in earlier, we see almost no change, in, especially in the phase of the diurnal cycle of precipitation. You can see the entire tropics is white. It's just no change. Even the amplitude change, which I've, I've made, um, I've, I've forced it to show up here. You can see it, it is happening in the ITCZ. There are changes of both signs in the, in the amplitude of the precipitation. But these changes are tiny compared to even the mean, ampli the mean diurnal amplitude. So, and the same, the same story for the winds. We're basically no change in the diurnal cycle of winds over these five day forecasts when we make clouds invisible. So we can essentially, if CAM5 is getting the diurnal cycle right for the right reasons, we can reject the hypothesis that it's the direct radiative effect of clouds that is driving the, driving the diurnal cycle of convection. And so last week when the computer went down, uh, we had another experiment running to test another hypothesis, which is that just the short wave absorption by the water vapor. But I haven't gotten to, to see those results yet, so this is all to be continued. But I think it's interesting. I think it's going in the right direction. So just to wrap up, um, I think this capped approach um, shows a lot of uh, utility. It's uh, good for facilitating, facilitating good comparisons with observations. It helps to separate fast and slow processes. And it encourages a focus on the processes themselves, um, as opposed to just showing a climatology with a bias. Um, the examples showed comparison of model versions, observations using, used to evaluate the model in, this, in the stratocumulus case, observations used to understand model errors in the East Pacific case, and then hopefully, <laughs> if we get there, the model used, being used to better understand observed phenomena in the diurnal cycle case. And we have some science conclusions here. Um, the, the bummer ones, CAM4 stratocumulus are unphysical. CAM5 stratocumulus break up too easily during the daytime, leading to biases. Um, the physics dynamics feedback leads to a precipitation bias, but we don't know how to fix it. And then the, the one optimistic note is the CAM5 has a decent diurnal cycle in the middle of the ocean, um, and it's not due to the cloud radio effects. So I'll stop there. Thanks, Brian. We can have a few minutes for, for some questions. So. Brian, is five days long enough to catch a radiation feedback in the upper troposphere in the tropics? Or is it, you know, is the, the radiative time scale is long enough that you're, you still essentially got memory of your 
initial conditions in there. I'm just curious what you think. What you think I about don't that. think so. Well, I think here's here's the way I'm thinking about it, at least as of right now, is that if you go back to the paper that just that is the best description of that hypothesis is, is a Dave Randall paper from 1991, and he the way he describes it, it is a direct cloud radiative effect. The clouds cool during the nighttime and destabilize and lead to convection and, and absorb shortwave during the daytime and inhibit convection. And so that, that time scale should be fast. It shouldn't be associated with slowly adjusting the temperature structure of the tropics as you, as you get rid of that cloud radiative effect. I think that's another step away from the direct, the direct process that he described. So I think so I'll tell, you, I'll tell you that I did the same experiment and let it run a long time in a different configuration of the model, but it doesn't matter. And the tropical circulation completely changes when you let the clouds be invisible. But that's going to develop as, the, as you cool and dry the troposphere, you're going to change the circulation because you're changing the structure of the, of the troposphere. And that's a, slow, that's a slow, slower feedback process than the, than the hypothesis for the diurnal cycle. OK, when you have a models and observations and analysis, assume the underlying error covariance matrices of each of those climatology, how confident are you in terms of how good those errors and so they can weigh them one versus other so that you can have a, a good analysis? Are you asking how confident I am that the analysis is providing a good climate? No, the analysis depends upon the errors of each of those components. Right. You need to know observation errors in terms of how good are they, oh. that kind of thing. How can you comment on those? I cannot. I hope that they're good enough. Maybe somebody else can comment on the components that go into the analysis. We just, we just assume that the analysis will be a better representation of the state than CAM's native representation. Okay. Thank you. You showed that you talked about an anomaly in precipitation where there was too much precipitation in the convection. And you showed a, a vertical profile of latent heat, heating. Uh, have you looked at all at the partitioning between the uh, liquid phase and the ice phase? And does that play a role in possibly explaining some of this? That low level heating that seems to be driving, driving the circulation and feeding the feedback is all liquid. I don't, I don't know if ice processes become very important in that feedback mechanism. For the lowest parts, I'm sure the upper parts right. are very important. Well, but if all the water gets condensed too low, then there, it doesn't have a chance to turn into ice. Well, maybe. I don't know. I haven't, I haven't looked at it. Maybe Dave has something to say about it. There's a, there's a pretty big ice phase at, with, in deep convection. And if there, you would expect there's a fair amount of the precipitation is from the ice phase in that case. So I guess I'm confused. There's definitely ice. Ice is associated with that heating higher up. But I think that the feedback mechanism that's leading to the precipitation bias is really coming from the conversion to liquid. So Brian, um, in terms of the capped approach or any approach that really wanted to focus on using experiment experimental data, uh, what would be the minimum length of time you would need contiguous observations in order to, to get useful information out of, out of this forecast approach? If you assume that the observations have very little observational error, so you can trust them, I think that you need only a small amount of contiguous data um, 
to make useful evaluations of the model processes. So maybe a month, like if you went out for a month into the Southeast Pacific and you got really good a really good observational data set that resolved the diurnal cycle, then you could compare that directly with those, those observations, or those CAPS simulations that I just showed. And it would be absolutely useful in understanding climate biases of the model. So I think it, a month would be more than adequate. Hi, I was, what's the spin-up of precipitation? It, it, it is spinning up, or is it spinning down? Do you, have you looked in the first six hours of the of the cap runs? It might depend on what regime you're looking at. If I had to guess right now, I think that there's in the first few hours, if you change something, then in the first few hours, you end up having excess precipitation and then it settles down. Um, if you don't change anything, if you just do this, the normal spin up cycle and then start the forecast, I don't see a lot of noise in the precipitation in the first few hours of the forecast. Other people with more experience could could comment on that, but I, I haven't noticed any any obvious big precipitation spike at the very beginning of the forecast. Any more? Yeah, in the uh, in the Western Pacific region, there's a very large amplitude of uh, sea surface uh, diurnal sea surface temperature variation. You know, typically one to three degrees. Do you have any comment on how that might factor into this overall picture? Right, that's a good point. So in in our forecast, we are using a, a daily SST product. That's, and we're interpolating within the, within the day between daily points. So we don't have a diurnal cycle in, in our SST, but we do have a diurnal cycle that seems realistic in the precipitation, which suggests to me that maybe the diurnal cycle in the SST is not strongly coupled to the diurnal cycle in precipitation. But we, we can and we will um, put some kind of diurnal variability into the SST to see what effect it has. On the, on the precipitation. I mean, it's also true in the stratocumulus region, there's a smaller amplitude diurnal cycle in the SST, and people have argued that that is important for the structure of the clouds. So it's, it's useful across the basin. It's useful to at least c consider the diurnal cycle of SST across the basin. <coughs> okay. I guess I wanted to ask, uh, you've chosen to sh talk about tropical processes as a demonstration of CAPTAR. Are there other parts of the planet that you're interested in? Yeah, absolutely. Well, <laughs> that I'm interested in. Um, yeah, so CAPT has been has been applied um, in a lot of different regions. A lot of the early studies with CAPT are really focused on the ARM Southern Great Plains site. Um, I've also seen relatively recent studies using the CAPT framework at Arctic sites. Um, um, I think Sheba, maybe Barrow too. So it can be applied wherever you have something to compare to. Even if you don't have anything to compare to, you could still do it, but it makes it a little less interesting. Okay, well, I think we should let people go. Uh, let's thank Brian Wilson, right?